So thank you for being here and welcome to the 12th, I believe, ever Hump Day Hanger presentation sponsored by supercub.org and the Not So Straight and Level podcast. Again, as I do every week, I want to thank all the supporting members of supercub.org and the advertisers that are supporting supercub.org. You are the people that are making this stuff happen. So thank you very much. And if you enjoy these things, I've gotten a lot of great emails and stuff uh, and text messages and everything else from folks about these presentations and some great suggestions about other people to have on. And, uh, you know, just uh, uh, keep Keep sending these around and getting people hooked up to them. So if you know other people that'd be interested in this kind of stuff, feel free to send the YouTube links and, and those kinds of things around. Uh, be uh, great to have as many people seeing these as possible. So just a reminder, the 2021 calendar submissions are open for the supercub.org calendar, and you'll find that submission link on the supercub.org homepage. So uh, next week, uh, we've all seen the YouTube pilots that make everything look like it's really easy. But next week, we've got uh, veteran mechanic and aviator Steve Pierce talking about the stuff that happens when things go wrong when you're playing around on sandbars and all these other things. He's recovered quite a few airplanes uh, and had some interesting experiences himself. So that'll be a really good uh, interactive discussion next week. So during the course of the presentation, you might want to ask questions. Uh, you can use the chat, the Zoom chat to do that. Uh, you can also use the YouTube chat. I'll be monitoring that as well. And then when we get into Q&A time, you can raise your hand in, in uh, Zoom to ask a question. So, so I'm really pleased uh, to have Chris and April Neeson doing tonight's presentation. They are a couple of really special people and a really special family. And they're going to talk about their journey of retracing Flight of Passage. I'm going to let them introduce themselves and tell their story. That's I know you're going to enjoy it. Hello. Over to you, Chris and April. <laughs> Hi, I'm April. This is Chris. Um, we are the Neesons. Uh, Chris is, um, and I am a child psychologist. Um, and we have a three year old daughter named Effie, uh, who we had after we were married 20 years. And he, um, she's amazing. Um, she has some severe disabilities, but um, she lives her best life every day, mostly because Chris is such a great adventurer. As you will see tonight, he brings us along on his adventures, so. Yay, I'm Chris. Uh, I got into flying in college when I, well, actually I was uh, flying radio controlled planes with my brother and my father for years and my teen, early teens and then in college, a friend of mine introduced me into flying, and I started doing it just for the fun of it. And that's when I uh, followed my wife and her PhD journey to the University of Maine. And uh, that's just where basically the presentation starts. Uh, living in Maine, this is the late, <laughs> late 1990s. This is where all of this madness starts. Let me share my screen and start getting, this will be just photo only. I wanted to do some videos, but it's just too, um, well, I'm just, I'm not that technical. And maybe we're, we're sort of COVID hiding here. We're hiding here in Northern Michigan. So our internet bandwidth isn't the greatest. So I'm gonna share my photos with you guys. And we're going to start with the flight of passage. If you guys have never read this book, well, not sure why you're here, but it's a great book uh, written by Rinker Buck. And it's just, it's, um, well, it started out with this guy, Mr. Jeff Russell now, or JP Russell, not to be confused with the other Jeff Russell and there might be other Jeff Russells too. I'm really confused on that one. There's a lot of Jeff Russells on supercub.org maybe, but this one happens to live in Maine. And uh, we befriended him in the late 1990s and I took him back flying. He kind of uh, enjoyed it. And one day he came to me and said, I'm gonna buy a Piper Cub. And I said, that's the stupidest thing. Let's buy an airplane where we can go somewhere in it. And he says, nope, I'm buying a Piper Cub. 
and the first flight in that Piper Cub, and I was hooked. I loved Piper Cubs from then on out. He handed me a copy of this book, Flight of Passage. I read it cover to cover in like three or four days, which is a record for me. I think I've read 20 books in my whole life. So to finish a book in three days, uh, I was amazed by his uh, Rinker Buck's accounts of the, the journey across what he could remember from 25 years ago, uh, which is amazing to me because our trip was just six years ago. I can't remember <laughs> half the things. I'm glad I have it written down. Um, so, you know, that got us fly into flying and we took, Jeff and I took that cub everywhere. This is somewhere in New Hampshire. Uh, this is Key West, Florida. Uh, this is obviously Metropolis, home of Superman. And also my dog, Lenny, who passed away last year, but he probably had 400 of the 700 hours that I had in the J3 Cub sitting in the front seat. And boy, did he love it. Well, one day, April and I were camping. This is at a Super Cup sponsored event called OK18. And we were just having a grand old time with everybody there. Obviously, it was a little bit of flooding. You can see that in the back. But on the way home, uh, with our camping gear, we could never get above like 4,500 feet. And I was thinking, how on earth am I going to make it to the West Coast in this plane? How am I going to follow along and do that book someday? So Jeff, meanwhile, had purchased this plane, a PA-11, you guys probably know it well. It's just, it's, it's halfway between a Cub and a Super Cub. It's got a lot of quality features of the Super Cub. And it's faster, more horsepower. His has a 90 horse. Uh, I flew it many times. I flew another PA-11, and I think it's one of the better Cubs ever made. It's probably why Cub Crafters and Legend Cub modeled their Cubs after the 11. It's just, it's, it's the perfect airplane, in my opinion. And if you're not wanting to haul everything in the whole world, um, great airplane. So as I'm looking through the Barnstormer ads one day, this comes up. And I couldn't believe my eyes. It said, this is the flight of passage plane. If you want to owe it, pay me the big bucks, 25 grand. So uh, I first called up Mr. Russell up in Maine. I was like, what do I do? And he says, well, of course you have to buy it. OK. So for I call up Ken, and he's the nicest guy. I said, listen, uh, I feel like I need to try to talk you down a little bit because that's my job. So 24, five, he's like, well, how much would it cost you to think to get it home? I told him about 2,500. So he said, all right, let's do 22, five. So he came down on his price. And he was just the nicest guy. And uh, so I met up there, drove up there with a, uh, well, I, I, after his wife said, of course you should buy it. <laughs> yes. I do forget to mention that. <laughs> I first went to April. I even had a presentation on why I should buy it. <laughs> she said, yes, you can buy it, but you can't sell the J3, which did impress a lot of people. So I got to uh, somewhere in uh, uh, northern or southern upstate New York. and. Uh, Harriman and West was the closest airport. And so it was kind of the upstate Vermont area. I met a couple other Super Cub guys there. And we loaded this into a Penske truck and headed on to St. Louis. I meant to get a photo of us unloading it out of the truck, but I didn't get around to it. So this is us in the fall in our little tiny street in St. Louis, Missouri. We had lived in town in St. Louis at the time, I'm trying to load it into my one car garage. As you can see, well, it didn't fit and it ended up 
we had to deflate the tires to actually get it into there. So over the next coming months, uh, I took the plane apart piece by piece and labeled lots of parts that probably didn't need to be labeled. And over the course of this, I started posting, of course, on supercub.org and, and I made lots of people were interested and wanted to help. And that was, that really kept me going. It was lots of fun hearing from all the support from people on supercub.org. And one of them who you'll see next week was Steve Pierce. He says, hey, why don't you bring that thing down to my place in Texas? We'll put it in a jig and we'll see if it's straight and see what parts. Well, if you've read any of the book, you know that there's some bends and some pieces. Anyways, there's some parts that weren't straight on that airplane. So when we took it down there, to Texas and we put it in his jig. Oh, it was one of the worst times. Steve takes an all basically a ice pick and starts going through the sandblasted parts and everywhere it punches through, he puts a little bit of green tape and you can't really see, but there's green tape all around on this, oh, it's just everywhere, green tape and you can see on the ground, there's a sawzall where we had to take parts off. Later in talking with, with uh, the Kern, I guess they used it in an air show and one of the guys landed it really hard and they, they just beat it back into shape with a hammer. And I mean, that's what a lot of people did at the time. And well, some people still do, but I wanted a straight airplane. So we were gonna get this right. Um, there was talk about uh, with Tom Ford and Tim Ferriss there pictured. Um, do I just go get a whole new fuselage or do I keep this one? And a part of me did, I, I didn't want to slap a 71 hotel sticker on a different airframe. I wanted to keep as much of the original airframe as possible. So five months later, <laughs> Oh, five months in Graham, Texas. It's a long time. Love those guys, but that says a long time. But uh, we got this fuselage and I saved probably two thirds of the fuselage. So we replaced about a third of it, over 50 feet of tubing we replaced. Added some features, some STC, Super Cub baggage, some stuff to make our cross country trip more tolerable. The next a uh, year we loaded it, took it in my Jeep and towed it on my little trailer down to Georgia where I was helped assemble it. And this is putting the wing together. Now the wing I actually saved probably 99% of. The only thing I had to replace was the uh, butt rib uh, which had you know hundreds of holes in it. But all the other ribs, uh, I think I had to replace a few other ribs too. There's a story from Steve Pierce about that too, but mostly we repaired and only replaced the butt ribs. And so happy to report that that's mostly a 71 hotel in there. So there is a video from 1966, uh, 65 actually, of Kern taking his first uh, ride in the uh, for his first solo flight in the Cub and so we knew what paint job it had and this was just like Jeff Russell so of course I wanted one but obviously in the uh, white and red it's actually a tan and red uh, in the book they painted the wings with a starburst I decided not to do that because I thought it was ugly <laughs> But they, they did it so you could see him in the desert. And I said, nah, heck with that. Which one day I would later regret. Well, after lots of fights with the FAA, well, not really fights, just it took a long time to get the STC. So well, we had some, we had some field approvals and, and that was a rough one. And we were able to figure our way through all the field approvals. So nobody talked about the date, but on June, I don't know. It was June 13th. It was Friday the 13th. 
I took my first flight in 71 Hotel, and there's a nice video of it, but the, that's the first takeoff, and it flew great. It flew wonderful right from the start. I sat in the back seat because, well, that's just what I do. I'm, I'm a J3 driver. Well, now I pretty much always sit up front, but oh, it just flew fantastic. It climbed away. Uh, ended up ended up putting a 90 horsepower in it. I sold the 85 that, that it had. The 90 is just a great strong engine. And it just performed so well. So this is my first time putting gas into it. First time of several thousand of putting gas into it. It just has the one tank on the left side to save weight. Uh, I still have a low gross weight of 12, 20 or something crazy. So there's no sense in having all the extra. Uh, well, every once in a while, there's a reason to have all that fuel, but rarely do I need that much fuel. So I just have the one tank. So we flew it uh, five days later, six days later up to Sentimental Journey. Uh, actually, April met me up there, took an airline, of course. I flew it by myself. Some of us had to work. So, uh, went to Sentimental Journey, and it was, you know, a grand time, beautiful weather. If you haven't read the book, you can see the water bag there between the, between the wheels, although it, I never actually filled it up. There is a water bag. That was one of the funny things is just randomly, people would send me water bags. I ended up with like three or four water bags after starting this journey. So this is one of the ones that was easy and lightweight and made sense. So I brought this one with me. And so we flew around in a couple of outings. This is our first off field landing, April refusing to get out of the airplane. <laughs> I don't know why, but I just had to get a picture of our first off field landing in a hay field. And our, on our way, we flew all the way to the east to, um, well, it wasn't quite New Jersey, but they had, we flew a little farther east to Connecticut and met Brinker and Kern Buck. It was a really amazing time. Uh, Steve and Laura got everything uh, together to meet these two, to meet up. I wouldn't say they're best of friends, uh, but they do, they get along fine. Um, but it was just really just one heck of a day. Jeff Russell flew down with uh, Mr. Crow and uh, it was just, amazing day. We um, we talked about, there's, there's actually a link in the description, but we talked about for over an hour about the flight and the route that we would take and some more little interesting things that happened on their flight that maybe didn't even make it into the book. So uh, if you get time, click on that and you may want to do it two times speed or something, but it is kind of interesting. Uh, so it was, it was also funny when I took both of them for a ride separately, uh, uh, Rinker was always about showing me everything in the area and pointing out landmarks and Kern was all about flying the airplane. I mean, exactly like it was in the book. Uh, Rinker was the navigator, Kern was the flyer and, uh, we did one landing and Kern was like, no, that's terrible. We're going around because he had to do a better landing than that. He did. It was great. Um, I would have loved to, to take it solo, but uh, we weren't able to do that. So we started back east. I mean, started back west from there. That was our official start. Kind of recreated the picture that they did in front of the airplane that's in the back or the co back cover of the book, I think. This is Tom Ford and Lenny Bruce kind of taking a break as we're doing all this. Uh, Tom probably flew 70%. Well, he flew 100% of it with of the flight, but only 70% of it with me. He ran ahead and worked for like a week or something. But uh, yeah, it was, it was nice to have Tom there. He's a mechanic, most of you know him, uh, raised by wolves. And uh, he, he, we just had a grand time. 
So this is back eastbound in the back. You can't really see, but that's New York City as we're flying westbound. And there's Tom and there's Lenny Bruce in the baggage compartment. He did okay. Uh, he ended up traveling with my mother, uh, who we'll get to later, but this is just one of the sights at the stops that we saw on the way there. There's much to be seen. This is part of the part of the scenery that, that they would have seen in 1966. You know, they say part of the book, they're following the toll, the toll road, and then they're going through tunnel, toll road tunnel, although their day was much worse weather. I remember this beautiful sunset specifically on the way back into a uh, sentimental journey because April was about to throw up. She was so sick and not she was had a headache. It was something terrible. She was about to die of a headache. So speaking of Lenny Bruce, every time we got to where we were going, usually waiting on us, was my 75-year-old mother with this car and my dog Lenny and a trailer that she towed for us called 71, the 71 Hotel. <laughs> so the four of us, or the five of us, including Lenny, Lenny would open this up every night and stay in the hotel. And it was great. She put the pictures of us, a little weird nowadays to have my picture <laughs> on the front of it, but uh, on the side, it had the map so people could see where we were flying and all the stops we were taking. And it had some links to the, uh, the website. So it was really cool. So from Lock Haven, day two, we started and then this is just one of the things that you see, one of the intriguing things that you see. And uh, this is obviously a, a turntable. Like I've never seen a turntable in use at a locomotive yard, but if you look closely, uh, that's in Altoona, Pennsylvania. And then um, we stopped at a glider port we had to go like, we landed and had to go around some guys flying radio controlled airplanes. God forbid. No, they were just these old guys just sitting in the middle of the runway in their chairs and they had no intention of moving. Absolutely no intention of moving. So, so we went around them and landed. That was, they were very nice people. They were. It, it turns out uh, the owner, they was, it's a world class glider port. People come all over the U.S. to fly. It's near State College. I don't remember the name of it, but their longest flight, believe it or not, uh, was landing in Selma, Alabama. So it's, that's incredible. Like that would take me all day in a plane with a motor and they're doing that in a glider. So uh, yeah, that ridge runs pretty much past our house in Chattanooga all the way down to Selma, Alabama. It's, it's amazing. Uh, there are also st stunt doubles for the movie, the remake of the Thomas Crown Affair when they went gliding. So that was cool. They showed us some pictures of that. So uh, now we're going to pause for a second and uh, we're going to read for a section of the book where they're navigating uh, stack to stack, where they're looking at steel mills. They can't really find their way. And then they remember some <laughs> barn, barnstorm blarney from their fathers. Pittsburgh, my father used to say to us, you know what they call it? Hell with the lid taken off. It's awful there, but we always got through. What we did see was stay out over the rivers between the mills, and then we'd fly the steel plants stack to stack, stack to stack ahead of us. Flashing pinkish red in the haze was the beacon on a tall obstruction. I stared at the map. We were quite lost at the moment, but I quickly scrolled through all the possibilities, eliminating other nearby obstructions by poking my head out into the air and squinting down at the obvious landmarks, the rail junctions and railroads. The tower ahead of us was the first tall one east of the Mongahela, which had to be the big U.S. steel blast furnace at Braddock, clearly marked on the sectional map as stack with a flashing red beacon. So... We uh, didn't quite have, because we had such a clear and unlimited day, <laughs> we didn't quite have to do that, but that's one of the neat descriptions from uh, 
uh, his book that I always stuck in my head. And so we, we did fly by several steel mills and still working, as you can see. Um, this is one of our first stops on the second day on our charted stop. Now, the, the first stop they did was Washington County, but we stopped before it because gas was several bucks cheaper. And these two had driven 40 minutes from somewhere I can't remember. And uh, it was just really cool. They drove all the way to see us and met us at the gas pumps. And we talked to them. They ended up taking us out to lunch. Uh, had a good time. And I don't have a picture, but we ended up going to Washington County. It's maybe 15 miles to Washington County. And if you haven't been there lately, it's, it's a very, uh, it's grown up. It's got jet service and it's got a large FBO and they obviously catered to the large. So I was taxiing in and I told April, I was like, I bet you they haven't even heard of us. So we get there and we stop and the line guy says, what can we get for you? I'm like, well, we just got gas. So we're good. He's like, oh, I was told to give you guys all the gas for free that you needed. <laughs> oh. oh. Well, he ended up giving us a whole case of oil, which actually worked in the long run because we needed to change the oil the next evening. Uh, but it was it was just one of the hilarious moments where I, you know I figured nobody had heard of us, yet they were ready and waiting on us. So we continued westbound and just some of the really neat fields of Pennsylvania and then into the Ohio. And uh, we stop and see John Graham. Many of you guys know John Graham is also on supercub.org. And mom was already there, of course. And he put us in his hangar. We changed the oil. It had already been 25 hours. So we changed the oil, put the rest of it in the back for consumption later. And we continued westbound the next day. If you guys don't know this, Longaberger Basket Company was their headquarters. I think they've gone out of business since then. Uh, if you talk to people, since this is, I can't say, but apparently the width of the handles on that is less or is greater than the width of an airplane wing. I don't, I can't <laughs> say anything other than we were well above it and I could not judge those distances, but apparently an airplane can fit through the handles of the Longer Burger Basket Company. So we stopped and John Graham caught up with us. This is Southwest, uh, this is Columbus Southwest. And they had never heard of us. It was kind of a weird, they, they, they were supposed to find us there and they never did, but John Graham found us. And so he took, some, he had a great photo. We took a lot of midair, we took a lot of photos midair and got some really nice ones on our trip as we continued westbound. This is through Ohio. Didn't see as many people that day. But what we did see, so the night before at John Graham's, I had gone on a walk while they were changing the oil. And this random guy comes up behind me on a bicycle and this dirt road scares me to death. Asked me about where to stay or something. I had no idea. Anyway, I guess he was doing some sort of cross country bike ride. So whatever, I, we chatted for a few minutes. I told Chris about it and we- Lost went on our way oh yeah that's right he lost a bet that's what he was doing and his company was going so i i don't know somewhere from like cincinnati to columbus or something they were going on a retreat or something and he had to bike there because he lost the bet so that's what he was doing anyway so the next day we're flying and we land and we land one of these at places. one of these little places here and like on landing i see the guy I'm like, that's that bicycle guy. <laughs> and he was waving at us. So, yeah, it was fun. So we continue westbound. Uh, we hit the Mississippi. And uh, we hit, uh, oh, where are we now? Lee Bottom. Yeah. So Lee Bottom, we lost John Graham, but we picked up Tulsa Dave and 
Dalton Bill, which I don't know why we called him that. No, Georgia Bill. I think his name was something Dal Dalton somebody. I don't Anyways, know. Anyways, so we'll, we'll call him Georgia Bill. So we don't give up any names. Uh, anyways, um, so we landed there. They were wonderful. We had two friends. We had mom that was there and some other friends that met us in the camper. So we were all set for the evening. It was a wonderful night. Mm. Left the next day, continuing westbound. Now we're in uh, Indiana, getting into Kentucky and the Kentucky Swale. And if you don't remember, part of the book about the Kentucky Swale is where they uh, they got into some bad weather, as did we. Uh, you can start to see it, but they they Hank. The Stearman man had given them the specific route to take that was in Kentucky that would take them and the weather would stay clear the entire way. So I'll let April read a passage from that. Hank had opened up for us a magic stretch of land near the bottom of Illinois. The Wabash emptied into the Ohio when we followed that for an hour, crossing south of the banks when we reached Paducah, Kentucky. The rail line that Hank had circled in red grease pencil was easy enough to find. We picked it up and the country below us changed quickly after that. For the next hour and a half, the twin rails alternately shimmying in the sun or bathed in deep shadows hypnotically drew us down through the craggy hill country of western Kentucky and Tennessee. The weather pushing up from the Gulf had developed more or less as predicted. Frequently low clouds forced us down to just a few hundred feet above the ridge lines. My field of vision was restricted in the back seat and I often could only see straight down. My vertical view had a disorienting Alice in Wonderland quality to it as if I were tumbling head over heels down into the land instead of following over it. As Kern followed the serpentine terrain, the rail line, the river rapids and the two sides of the ravine merged together and sped by underneath. So as you can see, we were just as they were skirting some weather there and we ended up making it pretty far into Kentucky, but we had ended up having to stop for that, as you can see right in front of us. Uh, we did end up hitting a wall. We waited it out. Um, it was probably a couple hours. We went and got some a snack, waited a couple hours, and this huge torrential downpour came, and then all of a sudden it was a beautiful day. Just as you see here, we headed west to an, an overnight stop that they had not picked, but Sykes to Missouri was our pick. And for any of you that know Sykes to Missouri, it's for the throat rolls at Lambert's Cafe. So uh, they pick you up at the airport and take you in the back way. That place is always crowded, although it wasn't quite crowded that evening. They take you in the back and you get to bypass the line and they really do throw hot rolls randomly around and people catch them and it's a it's a nice dinner and uh, it was a lot of fun so we we overnighted there at the campground of course uh, then the next day we didn't go too far before getting to another amazing area uh, this is one of the kind of the cool things we saw is a dredging barge going down and as you can see it, it picks up in the middle of the channel and then it floats it on a conveyor belt to the very end and drops it off on the side. I, I thought that was intriguing. That's a lot of work for a lot of less work of digging and drop, dropping, digging and dropping, just conveyor belt it off. So there's a tugboat pushing a tugboat that's a tugboat. I don't know what you call that. A pushers. So this is um, Haiti, what we thought it was, but it ended up being Haiti. It's a grass strip. I just picked it up because it was a grass strip. I thought there would be nothing there. But boy, and how was I wrong. It, the whole local population came out. They sent a reporter out from the local newspaper. Uh, we met uh, Dick Reed was a humble World War II flying legend there. I don't know if he's still around, but he flew P-38s in World War II, and he still flew ag planes for these guys. They did the... Uh, there he is. Uh, there he is there. Oh, hey, what an awesome guy to talk to. But 
they did a lot of work on, I think it's thrush airplanes at Midcontinent. I'm sure somebody will yell at me that I'm wrong, but uh, that's, that's what they worked on there. They were the reseller there. And so it was just an amazing time. So we continued off down. We basically going straight south towards Memphis. Uh, our next flight was to meet some friends there and this is still just flying over them. Definitely at 500 feet. Well, this is over water, so it's okay. And this is over land and this is over land. <laughs> this is what you'll hear about next week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Steve will tell you all about this. Um, so we got to Memphis, we landed, met all sorts of family and friends, and we had a wonderful barbecue, and somebody from Memphis will remind me what the barbecue was, but holy cow, it was good. So we took our lunch from there and headed up back westbound. If anybody knows what this is, I usually ask this as a question, but these are rice patties. It's just something I'd never seen before. So rice patties in Arkansas. And I have no idea why there's like drunk mower spots. I don't know. Anyway, somebody just goes through there. So more odd things, a truck pulling a truck that's pulling a truck. And then there's a truck pulling a truck, pulling a truck that's pulling a truck. <laughs> so finally we get to Brinkley and this is one of the uh, I can't, I can't even have April read from that. It's almost like an R-rated section of the book, but uh, Brinkley is one of their worst stops. Uh, they're not treated very well, uh, but we get there and we're starting to try to find a place to put up for the night. And uh, we have to find our hotel room that rents by the hour, whatever it is. But apparently, we were looking for the backpack of mine. Of course, I was in charge of it. And it contained uh, Kernbuck's logbook. And boy, was I upset. It, we had left it back in, at, uh, in Memphis. It's, it's only an hour away, but oh, it freaked me out. So immediately, I and uh, Georgia Bill take back off eastbound. We leave everybody there. And, we have to go back eastbound to get it. Well, on the bay back, we look at this, and this is sitting on top of Brinkley. So we stop, and some guys field, or I don't know. We just, I get bored of flying around waiting on it. So we just stopped on, waited here on this guy's road. Meanwhile, the rest of us are furiously tying down airplanes that are trying to blow in the almost tornado. Yeah. <laughs> it was terrible. Yeah, that was a big, it was terrible. Big storm. Well, we got there and we found the deluxe in and my camera broke at this point. So between here and north of Dallas, I don't really have any pictures. Um, it was, it was a lot of beautiful area. So um, we, uh, we went uh, middle, through the middle of Arkansas through to Queen uh, Tulsa Dave left us at Queen. I also left a fuel cap in Queen. Luckily, my mother and my uh, dear, dearest niece had not passed through there yet and made a detour to the airport. And sure enough, just past the taxiway towards the uh, runway, there's <laughs> my, she finds a fuel cap. And so I'm awaiting at the next stop for them to bring me my fuel cap. <laughs> which is very nice. So this is uh, campground slash cabins north of Dallas. I'm sure somebody there knows what it is. Uh, it was just a beautiful area. Uh, the lake was really low. I do remember that, but uh, uh, we ended up, but they came there. So you could land there and there were cabins right behind it. So if if you're ever in the north of Dallas and want to stop, that was a great area. So we make it finally to Graham, Texas. And 
after 50 hours of flying, a brand new airplane has a lot of loose parts. And it was really nice to have Steve, <laughs> Steve Pierce and Tom Ford and everybody else be able to go through the entire thing and tighten up everything that had loosened up, um, fix a few things that had gone wrong. I think that the brakes were leaking, the fuel might have been leaking, anything that was possibly it's something leaking. with a tire. I don't remember what. But something had to yeah, be the tires had to be, the brakes had to be looked at. And, you know, so I, we stayed there, ended up staying there two days and it was nice. We camped there at the view, but uh, they went through it bit by bit. And uh, we finally started off the next day. And I remember specifically, uh, <laughs> and I bet Steve does too. He's like, I got some fuel. You want me to give you some fuel? I'm like, ah, we'll be fine. We'll Famous be last words. Famous last words. Well, we kept on westbound, and the next place we landed, the fuel was broken or notamed out of service or something. And so we had a quarter tank left. You can see it there. It might have been a little less than quarter tank, but it made my wife a little nervous. But you can see the uh, the Wasp Museum there in West Texas. Uh, I wish we'd had time to tour it, actually. I need to get back there someday. Uh, but the winds were howling. And, uh, it, you know, it basically asked them if there's ever, you know, winds are going to calm down. And they said, like, in a few months. <laughs> I mean. Uh, they were probably 30, 35 mile an hour winds. So sustained. It just was. It didn't, it didn't even back taxi. You just went wherever you could and took off. And it was the amount of winds. I just, I was scared to move it to tie down. So we never really left the airplane or I would have loved to have toured that. So continuing on westbound, uh, you can see the winds even down on that lake were crazy. Uh, we finally got our cowboy hats just as uh, Rinker and Kern did. Um, we, uh, we even waited on a, the people did they ever show up the news people i think they showed up but they, they never did aired. yeah they never aired this segment. i think we got upended by some sort of natural disaster <laughs> yeah or shooting people, or something people were dying <laughs> shot and, but the tv people did come they did come yeah. but we didn't make the news <laughs> yeah we, we weren't in bad enough news we didn't wreck or something so we make it uh this is yeah, this is the evening we spent in Carlsbad. That's one of the, that's one of the, the nights they stop in the book and they do a, uh, they, they basically overhauled their engine or something by one of the mechanics there. Well, we camped, it was like 150 degrees blowing 40 miles an hour, but we, we managed to get some sleep. Uh, but the next day, we started heading towards the Guadalupe Pass now. For those of you who read the book and have also been through the pass, you know that it's it's hyped up. It's almost like movie-like hyped up. But the way I think about it is from a 14-year-old that's in a backseat of an airplane that's going through this. It probably is pretty traumatic. My wife that was sitting in the front seat was when we got close to one of the, uh, if they had taken the route that we yet. took, we were close to, she was taking the Lord's name in vain. And, and it was not even there yet. I'm just saying it, it was one of the, it was crazy. The, the, so the past coming up is, is one of the highlights of the book, but it not really that big of a deal, but could be a big deal if the way we flew. So this is Wink, Texas. This is Charlie. Uh, I, if those of you who have been there probably met this guy. He seems like the biggest jerk, but he has a very dry humor. He was actually very nice in the end, but he had called reporters and yelled at April for not 
being on Twitter. I did not tweet enough for him, apparently. Yeah, so we didn't give him enough updates. We were late. But he was very nice, gave us free snacks. He was not happy. Food, and he's like, yeah, just use the taxiway. Everybody takes off from the taxi. He was sort of like my husband, a little crotchety. <laughs> no. <laughs> but nice. <laughs> Anyways, yes. So, direct from Wink. Um, yeah, it's direct from Wink to Carlsbad, and this is where I was messed up, is pretty much over nowhere. Now, you can go way out of the way and stay over roads, but Tom Ford and I just decided to go straight because, well, why wouldn't we? It's like modern times. We got GPS's and we'll be fine. We'll just go straight. Uh, so this is where we'll uh, let April read from uh, one of the problem areas in, in the book. Well, bang, well, bang, well, bang, 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 bang. Shit. What was happening? Violent, irregular vibrations were shaking the plane. Kern, we can put her down. If we ditch sideways and wipe out the wheels, we'll be fine. No, Rink, I'm not ditching 71 Hotel. I've got an airplane here. I think we can make Carlsbad. It was a hellish hour getting to Carlsbad, making minute by minute adjustments. Our trip was doomed. I knew that my brother was thinking the same thing. Every second that we ran the engine was only damaging it more. Even if we made it to an airport, we probably couldn't afford the repairs or more likely the new engine we'd need. We'd have to leave the plane in New Mexico and take a Greyhound bus home. The indignity of that seemed pathetic. Everybody knew about our trip by now and it was gonna end just east of the Rockies with engine failures. What fools we had been. Without a radio, we couldn't call in our position as we went down. And the water bag, the freaking water bag. I looked down to the hard tack desert below us. It wasn't, I wasn't the least bit worried about walking out. We could both make it 50 or 60 miles to Loving, even in our penny loafers, but we probably wouldn't last till evening without water. Suddenly it seemed incredibly imbecilic for us not to have a water bag and incredibly wise for my father to have suggested one. We had boxed ourselves into exactly the situation he warned against. Barnstorming Blarney had provided for this contingency, but we hadn't listened. And neither had we. You people sent us water bags and we did not fill it up. Nor did we have sunbursts on our wings. So we didn't have a water bag. But what, you know, what there is two of us, what could possibly happen? So about halfway between Wink and Carl's bed, Tom Ford radios back to me. He's like, hey, what's your oil temperature? And I looked down. I said, oh, red line, what's yours? He's like, yeah, red line. I'm like, oh. That's uh, a little warm there. So we are like, oh, shoot. So of course we're looking around for places to land and sure there's oil dr drilling, you know, they, they, there is some stuff around, but there certainly ain't much. And if we landed on one of those roads, who knows if we would be there, or if there'd be anybody, we certainly would have no cell phone service. So without any water, there we were over the same stretch of <laughs> desert. And you would never find us with the color of our wings being the same color as yeah. the desert. It, it was never. Literally <laughs> would have been impossible to find us. So <laughs> we uh, managed to gain some altitude and we judged, basically judged how well we were doing by where my needle was on the red line. <laughs> uh, but we were able to climb up a little bit higher get a little bit cooler air and it came down off the red line, but it stayed pretty much at that bottom of the red line until we landed in Carlsbad. And that was a rough night. We all slept uh, quite well, of course. <laughs> so this is the next day. And we learned to fly very early in the morning yeah. And very late in the evening, but during the day, in midday, we would just have to not fly. It was just we'd, too hot. We'd stop for five hours in the middle of the day. Uh, being as dry as it was, so there was just no cooling for the engine. So this is the next day we take off for the pass. Some other friends had met us too, but we continued on for the pass. 
Um, do you have a passage for that? And I'll yeah, I will. Just a second. so it was, it was amazingly beautiful. I have a short video of that too, but uh, it was just incredible leading up to the pass. So, okay. I mean, I was trying to climb the entire time. I'm like in full power in climb, and it's nine in the morning. But uh, this is just what I'm doing as I'm climbing away, trying to make it for the pass. Now the steep sides of the V were clearly visible just ahead of us, a fractured and veined mastiff of rock sloping up to meet us. In the turbulence, we were often pitched sideways, nose down. The aperture of the pass was quite narrow down below and it didn't fill the windshield. So it didn't seem possible that we could fit through. From these strange uncontrolled attitudes, immense boulders and broken tooth pillars of rocks came into view as if they were spinning up sideways to meet us. Individual rocks boldly stood out from the mass. I felt that I could see every pit mark and sandy abrasion. From a distance, the past had a harsh beauty. Closer in, it was ugly and gritty, and it just keeps going. But he was not kidding. Except, technically, the past is like 35 miles wide, so you could fly through the middle of it. Yeah. But we really tried to fly close to the mountain where we on think the they might have flown. On the route from Carlsbad, to El Paso would have taken on this route, but it really was, it may even be wider than 35 miles. It's stupidly wide, but we stayed pretty close to one side of the, there's one side of the opening of the pass. And I was about a mile from it. April thought I was like 10 he feet. He was not, he was not a mile from it. He was not. I was. Still contend that the wing could have hit at any moment. Anyway, she was, <laughs> we hit a lot of turbulence going through there and she screamed. Oh yeah, luckily he did not take that video. And I did take that, I just lost. You I lost that video. I lost that audio, <laughs> I hate it. So there's some salt flats on the opposite side and Tom Ford had the big wheels, but as you can see by his tail wheel, I was not able to land there. <laughs> And these are alfalfa fields that were prevalent. And this is people living in the middle of nowhere. Just in, weird little uh, cargo ship houses, container properties. Yeah, it was a big tough living out there. This is flying over El Paso International. And luckily we had Tom Ford with the transponder with us. And um, we stopped at, uh, I don't, can't remember. This is just west of El Paso. But uh, the airport that we had planned on going to had closed recently. And since uh, both April and I are Auburn University graduates, we thought, we thought, hey, why not the War Eagles Museum? We thought that'd be cool. So more alfalfa, uh, more sleeping in the middle of the day. This is dem Deming, I think. Yeah. And uh, we had a nice reporter come out, talk to us there. But, uh, and a lot of this stuff is still online there. Yeah, I think we, they, they did a newspaper story there. Yeah. yeah but so we, we sat for five hours, just basically in the hottest part of the day. So this is the evening where we make it to Lordsburg and just along this route. I, I basically never recommend this route in the middle of summer. This is a beautiful fall, fall or winter route, but man, middle hot. of the summer, whew, it was hot. Brutal. It was brutal hot. But it's beautiful evenings and beautiful days. This is the next day taking off. One of the most beautiful days, take just flying wise. Uh, Cochise County, they were waiting for us there. Uh, they had been waiting for us for like two days, apparently. <laughs> they, they, uh, there was a time change and we arrived before they were supposed to even open, but they came in, opened up the shop. There was a gift shop there they opened up. Uh, it was really one of the neatest little airports for a little 
town that, that I could ever imagine. And I'm just, yeah, super cute gift shop. And this is, the, I think, the first place where the guy brought his book and asked yeah. us to sign it. And there was like a line of people. It was just really cool. But great airport if you can get there. It was yeah, nice, super nice people. Yeah. This is the guy that brought a book. For, he drove like 60 miles. To he get, did. He drove like an hour to see us. Twice, apparently, because he'd come the day <laughs> before. come the day before. So this is continuing on towards Tucson, if you guys remember from the book. And it was just beautiful. A yurt in the middle of nowhere. And... We continue on to Mariana, and we there's a nice little restaurant in Mariana right on the field, and but on the door to it, on the way out, after we've already walked through it, <laughs> is please be advised rattlesnakes, and keep your kids and pets safe. So, uh, yeah. We didn't see any, luckily. We didn't see any, but uh, rattlesnakes, that was something... There was actually rattlesnakes in the book, if you ever read that part, but that's a whole nother issue. Now we did meet up with Kent there. He bought us lunch, I think. Uh, he he joined us through most of the day. Um, it was, uh, we had a good time flying with him, but he also, he told us how to wear our cowboy hats and win so they wouldn't come off. We have the secret. Yeah, we got to talk to him for the secret. This is uh, Elabend or Elabend. You can't pronounce the G. Um, the G is silent. We learned that through him because, of course, we were calling it Gilabend. This was a hilarious. Is this the airport with the jet? Yeah, that's right. Here. Okay, so yeah, <laughs> yeah. So here we are at this airport. This little tiny airport, like in the middle of nowhere, and they've got all these luxury jet magazines. Like there'll never be one. There'll never be a, never a be citation a there, like ever. Maybe. Maybe. Once. Although he also told us on the way there that uh, he was radioing us and telling us how dangerous the area was. That this was really prime drug running area, and so there was a stretch of highway here that is like one of the most dangerous stretches in the world, and you definitely don't want, you know, you just you want to make sure you got everything you need when you're on this stretch of highway. And we're like, oh, that's so interesting. So when we stop at Ela Bend, we get a phone call from Chris's mom. And guess what? She had run out of gas. And guess where she was? She was on that part. On that stretch of highway. <laughs> and we were like, and she had been trying to call us while we were flying and we didn't get that. So by the time we got to her, she had already. Well, the cops had saved the her. The cop or somebody nice had saved her and whatever. But uh, yeah, so that happened. Yeah, apparently the little truck, truck and trailer used it to be the gas. So onward westbound, we saw this in the distance. Uh, most of you probably know what that is that live out that way. That is a lot of solar panels. That is a lot of solar panels. I mean, yes. a crazy amount of solar panels. And they were all over. This is probably that stretch of area that he was talking about, I-10. Those mountains are not really patrolled, but it's just a lot of bad things happen in that area. Uh, this is... Nope. No, no, not okay. quite yet, though. So uh, this is Yuma, Yuma, Arizona. Uh, they asked us to land on 27 with a 27 knot crosswind. We told them, no, thank you. We'll take <laughs> uh, one of the other runways. But basically, 927 is the G is the regular runway, and all the military uses the other runways. But uh, we weren't going to be able to do that. So they gave us nicely one of the other runways. And we taxed in the millionaire for first, our second hotel or the third hotel. Of, we had a couple of hotels, but yeah, we were all tired and didn't want to put hot. up as hot as what we were. So we got a hotel room. That's, I guess, a Harrier or something coming into land. 
So the next day we take off westbound. This is now along the border. Uh, it was interesting because there's basically a moat and a fence along the entire border. Um, once so we do already have a lot of wall. We actually can attest to that. We've seen a lot of the wall, but most, there are a few areas that don't have it. Most of it, but it was also interesting to see how much agriculture was on the north side and then it stopped. We let all water, there was no water continuing on south of the border. So this is as we're still leaving. Now this is uh, getting into Calexico and on the bottom is uh, Mexicali, which is I guess the Las Vegas for Mexico. So it's you know, one of the few places where Mexico looks better on their side than our side. <laughs> so we stopped there. This is a little shack restaurant that we didn't get to eat at, but looked cool. April brought, took this picture. She couldn't believe we were buying actual sectional charts. And there we go along the border. There's the border patrol. And a lot of, a lot of solar panels. And it's starting to get mountainous. There you, you can see some of the walls. This is one of the stops, one of our last stops, just from the fun of it. It was a, I thought it was a grass runway. It was just dirt. But you can see where the wall, like in the steepest areas, stopped. But there certainly was a lot of it. This was a nice runway that a private guy had, private runway. Nice railway and a railway. Might have been a museum. I don't know. We're uh, descending towards straight ahead is the smog of San Diego. And so it's starting to get cool. And my oil temperature is loving Whee! it. We finally got below the red line. And it is beautiful on the way in. We about hit some skydivers, but that's a whole other thing. Anyways, and we stop here at the landing strip. This is uh, Brown, Brownfield, I think, in San Diego. Uh, some some uh, two reservists. I think they were married too. Or they yeah, were naval engaged. reservists. Mm -hmm. They stopped and bought us lunch, or maybe they did. We didn't allow them to buy. I hope we didn't allow them to buy us lunch. But they were awesome. They were younger, but uh, we talked about the trip and super nice to meet them there. So we made it to California. We fit the part, and uh, we just. We kind of had two stops on this trip. One was Oceanside and one was Flaybob Airport. The, ori the original airport they landed at, uh, San Juan Capistrano was no longer there. So we had to choose between two of them. So we chose Oceanside and then Flaybob contacted us like halfway through and said, no, come on up here. So we, we sort of had two endings to the trip, but it was fun. It was more fun that way anyway. So. Here we are flying over San Diego, northbound. Luckily, we had our transponder guy with us. That's the USS Midway down there. But this is really cool because you see that haze. There's this like ocean, what's it called? The June gloom. Yeah. And it's just kind of it's, always there. And you got to figure out how to get yeah, under it. It's basically the marine layer is right yeah. there. And uh, between the airspace, we there was one place where we had to be at 4,500 feet, and this next place we had to be under 2,000 feet. So we lost a lot of airspace to get underneath. Uh, there's Torrey Pines, I think. Yeah. And on our way up northbound, just really, you know, underneath it. Oh, I had to put a shirt on, a sweatshirt. It was on. cold. <laughs> it was freezing cold. It was crazy. Uh, northbound, there's Tom. And there's Oceanside right down when we land. There's a big celebration, just a grand time. Uh, this is my friend Donald Sparky. And I think I had way too much of what was in his hand. I don't know. They all went to dinner without me. He I, didn't make it. I didn't make it. I, I was celebrating <laughs> with was, these two. He fell asleep in that compartment, I think, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. So the next day we take off. Uh, just to complete the trip, there is where the infamous San Juan Capistrano, the helicopters, the avocados, 
that's the greatest part of the book. I think the avocados, if you ever read the book, it's so funny. Um, but it's basically uh, right here, a bean, this strip is where it used to be. So we continued on up to Flay Bob and they were the most awesome people there, gave us a place to stay. Air conditioner worked reasonably well. Uh, if you've never heard of Flay Bob, it's, it's, it's an, not in the, it's a more impoverished community but they train all their kids, go to school there and learn the trade. They learn trades, not all of them go into aviation, but quite a few of them do. Uh, there's a whole entire recovering uh, place there that, that all the kids have graduated from that school and they learned, they recover airplanes for a living. So it's really neat. Um, they have a great restaurant. They have a great restaurant there, a wonderful restaurant. And a fantastic fireworks display. So we recreated our, you know, our picture font black and white for the end and they invited us to stay. We took a tour, you know, Hollywood and whatever that is, whatever Hollywood those Bowl. are. <laughs> so we took a tour and we did what they call the fire on the mountain. So they shoot off fireworks and inevitably parts of the mountain catch on fire because it's so dry okay. there. Uh, but it was nice, it was wonderful. So that's it for westbound. I'm just gonna take it a little further, just really quickly. Uh, just some beautiful shots, Santa Paula. Uh, we basically went up, uh, this is not what they did in the book, but we went up A1A and just enjoyed the heck out of ourselves. And it was gorgeous. It was amazing. Uh, this is we. <laughs> this is since recovered, but you can see like the docks up here where they're. Anyways, the, the water is had gone down like forty feet from where this was. I think it's back up nowadays. And this is the West Coast Cub flying that I was about a week and a half early for, but they were nice. Said hi to me. More marine layer. This required a little sneaking into an airport. Yeah, definitely one mile clear clouds there. This was a nice officer that met us the next morning and was intrigued about our... Yes, but mostly what really happened was we snuck our camper onto the airport the night before yeah. and we weren't really supposed to. So when the nice officer came up the next morning, we were a little nervous. But he was super nice. But he, he was super care. nice and really just wanted to talk about our airplane. <laughs> yeah, so super nice. So we kept going north. That's the Hearst Mansion. Yeah. And just, there wasn't a lot of, you know, if we lost an engine. Eh. Well, I mean, a lot of you guys that fall on this site know that there's a lot of places you lose an engine. It's going to get ugly. And this is one of them. But it was so beautiful. It was just darn worth it. So we kept going under there. Underneath there is... Oh, look, there's a runway down there. This was our courtesy car. <laughs> this was the best courtesy car ever. <laughs> I think it was ever. Awesome. <laughs> I think it was the local EA chapter guy <laughs> just let us use his car. And I think I had to like unlock the door from the outside or something. Yeah, we had to climb in. I don't remember. Yeah, so we make it to San Francisco and this is where I'll stop. This is Stanford and Ended up dropping April off, taking her up to uh, San Francisco International, and she took a smoker Southwest flight home. And because again, some of us had to work. Ditched me and Lenny. Yep, so, and they flew back. So I know that's really super long. I hope we've kept you entertained during our time. Well, uh, Chris, um, I'm going to click the unmute button on our mystery guest, uh, Renker. You want to uh, unmute your uh... what? What? Hang on, if you unshare your screen, Chris. Okay. How do I? Okay, yeah. And uh, let me do this. Okay, Rinker, you're on. Okay. Can Can everybody see me? They can. Okay. So, 
My name is Rinker Buck. I, I wrote the book that these folks uh, so adequately, oh, there I am. Okay, so adequately uh, recreated in the journey. What was so fascinating about watching all the video tonight is, <clears throat> you know, how much of the country still looks the same. But I really appreciate this uh, this uh, broadcast or what I'm, you know, I'm almost 70 years old now and I don't even know what to call this thing, Zoom, whatever. <laughs> but um, it reaffirms uh, a very important principle, which is that if we had flown from New Jersey to California in 1966 and become the youngest aviators ever in the history to fly coast to coast, uh, that was great. That was great. But uh, nobody would ever remember it. What they remember is the book. Uh, so what this, uh, what, you know, Chris and April have done is, is affirm the power of book, which is great. And I've got a few more out there now, and I'm not trying to promote myself, but now, Here's, uh, am I doing all right, Steve? I'm just going to reflect on this for a few minutes. I think you're doing awesome. If anybody doesn't like it, raise their hand. Okay, nobody raise their hand. <laughs> all right. And, and yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, Chris and April are good? Yes. Okay, oh, yeah. good. So I'll just give you a few reactions to this video tonight, which was great. Aside from the fact that, uh, I mean, my goodness, the photographs really recreate what I remember. But um, all right, in the in the jig in Texas, uh, you know, Chris takes this thing. Chris and April take this thing all the way down to Texas to put it in the jig to make sure it was straight. You know, if you go back and read Flight of Passage, what we would do is put it in the gig in the jig to make sure it wasn't straight. <laughs> and I can just remember so many times later on when I found out where 71 Hotel was and taxiing behind it in another plane. And you'd see that that one landing gear, which it was Eddie Mahler who bent it on a air show. I won't go on too long, but, and you taxi behind it and you could see the wheel was just, you know, the landing gear was bent and the tire was just wearing out on one side. And, you know, when I was growing up in the sixties and that was our culture, we go, that's fine. That's fine. That now you can tell which airplane you're following. <laughs> <laughs> but Chris, you know, he's got a, ooh, you know, I mean, this is a guy, Chris, who suffers grievously from obsessive compulsive disorder. <laughs> uh, Chris, I disagree with you about the sunburst. The sunbursts were very valuable. They were. If I agree we, with you, Rinker. If I did have to land, in, if, if we did have to land in the deserts, you know, but but thanks, Chris, you, all right, how am I going to say this? It's going to, you a-hole. You, <laughs> you question our judgment on that. You know, if, you, if you're going to have to uh, land in the desert, you better hope you have some sunburst. All right, the water bags, okay? You guys go like, you know, oh, well, it was so terrible. You know, three or four people sent us some water bags, you know. I've received over 50 water bags so far. <laughs> and it, it got so bad, the book came out in, I'm trying to remember, like, you know, 95, 97, I think. And, you know, I was moving on to the next book. And my daughter, Charlotte, would call up uh, from the the stairs down below me 
and she, she always loved to run out and, you know, get the mail. she go, Dad, Dad, you know, you got a couple more water bags. You know. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, now, I heard a rumor that uh, April bailed out at some point. April, I mean, no. I, I don't know. Steve, you can tell me. Did you fly all the way to California or did you get out? No, 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 no. There was a bet going on actually about whether I would make it to California. And oh. I did. I flew every leg, every minute, all the way to San Francisco. Okay, then so I good. got so, on an airline. Good. But but um, that means that you can confirm the writing in the book. I mean, it was tough, right? When you hit the turbulence. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. It was... It was. And, and he does anytime there was turbulence, it's tough. That plane is not very big. It's hot. There's a lot of it. But especially going through the pass, and Chris tried to fly really as close to those, to the mountains. And it was... As you would expect a person flying that route to do. I mean, I just was... Yeah. I literally was <laughs> screaming. It was yeah, bad. She was literally <laughs> screaming her head off. And and I have video but, of the outside. And we are. We're... we're momenting 30 degrees in every direction up and down left and right uh there was an incredible right, but, but this is a, this is at nine in the morning I'll, I'll talk about the uh guadalupe pass in a minute but uh i mean you're not denying the account in my book that that was one brutal freaking oh, thing yeah. right oh yeah that's right no i'm okay a, i'm definitely a firm people argue against it I affirm that, that that is a difficult pass to go through. It's not yeah. as easy. I'll uh, I'll talk to you in in a in a second about the Guadalupe Pass. But uh, I love the uh, beautiful weather video you took uh, going through the Kentucky Swale. It, the weather it's it's amazing that you guys took this trip thirty years later or whatever it is. The weather was low, and you had to fly the low terrain to get through. Mm. Uh, and then uh, Brinkley, Arkansas, I just want to say in defense of my book, okay, uh, and I don't know, there might be some conservative Christians on here tonight. That's all right. But uh, Brinkley, Arkansas, we, we, we stayed that night at the hotel cheap the motel cheap and you know there were the walls are thin <laughs> and there were all kinds of noises coming through and, and you know i'm trying to get some sleep my brother Karen goes like wow these people really make a lot of noise and i they seem to snore <laughs> and then at at uh Two or three o'clock in the morning, these ladies came by and just, you know, knocked on the door and goes, "You boys okay? I mean, uh, do you need a little company? You know?" And you know, I'm going like, "No, no, no, we don't need any company. We just want to get some sleep." She goes, "Well, we can, we can help you get to sleep." <laughs> and I mean, it was probably 25 years later that I realized and I went back to Brinkley <laughs> that it, it was, you know, it was a certain kind of motel. And uh, by the way, Brinkley, Arkansas, that's where uh, Bill, Bill Clinton's uh, paramour, Jennifer Flowers, grew up. Okay. Um, I love the uh, the stuff about Wink that you have in there, uh, the Rattlesnake Championship of the World. It uh, affirmed so much with the book. Uh, uh, and Chris, you know, in April, I'm not going to be critical, but uh, we never stopped for five hours in the middle of the day to get. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Well, you took the trip in, uh, what was it? How many days did it take you? Number 14. Uh, no, 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 40. no. 14 round trip, seven days to get out there. No, but you were 14 years old and we were 40. Come on now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, all right. So I'm, I'm giving you a break. I'm giving you a break. It's, it's all right. But, uh, I mean, you know, five hours. No, and I can't remember where that was that you said you did that. But Multiple days. Men, men, Texas. We just, we just kept flying through and we were so naive. We didn't know anything. The, uh, Flight of Passage is a book about teenage naive tay you know we just kept flying and it's like anybody who flies in the west will tell you okay in, in, unless he's a bizjet pilot or something um, okay so between the hours of noon and four you don't fly you know <laughs> and we would just think like, hey, Hey Rank, what time is it now? And they go like, uh, it's uh, twelve thirty, you know. Like, and he goes, all right, here we go, advance the throttle, you know. And we fly over these hellacious mountains in extreme heat. And I go to my brother, whoa, these are pretty bad turbulence. And he goes like, yeah, but let's keep going. No. <laughs> We had, we had no idea, and, and we had no idea that we were flying the West with a Hershey bar wing on a P-11 Cub, <laughs> which is like the worst, the worst airfoil you could fly through the West, you know, and, uh, you know, and, and we get there and we go like, uh, Whoa, this is a little tougher than people thought. And I'll just say one last thing and then we can move on. Everybody else can talk and Steve can manage the, uh, you know, the Zoom event. But so uh, we were these young Catholic kids, you know, from a you know, fairly prosperous background in New Jersey and about, I don't know, two or three weeks before we took off, we had this wonderful fellow named James Yankaskis, who was a corporate pilot for uh, the Ronson Corp. And, you know, whatever he said would apply for us because we were like 15 and 17, we didn't know anything uh steve is it hard to say this we didn't know dick shit you know <laughs> and is that right steve oh, yeah. you've already said this so, so, <laughs> so he says all right so here's where you want to cross the mountains you know you fly to uh almost to el paso you fly to west texas and when you get there there's something called the Guadalupe Pass. And I want you to fly straight through it, you know. And I mean, you know, as Chris and April can tell you that flying straight through the Guadalupe Pass is like, uh, you know, a certification of death, you know. <laughs> the turbulence and everything. But, you know, Mr. Yang can't just told, told us to go through it. Yeah, we fly right. Yeah, that's it. And I, we had to climb the plane to 11,600 feet. And Chris, I'm going to tell you right now. I mean, you can contradict me, but you've never even taken that cup up to 11,006, you know. It was the craziest notion in the world. But this goes back to what Flight of Passage is all about. A couple of teenagers who were devoted, but they didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> you know. So we flew right through the middle of the Guadalupe Pass. And like, 
I don't know, it was like 15 or 16 years later, <coughs> a friend of mine wanted, uh, wanted me to bring a uh, uh, biplane back east. And I took off from, uh, uh, not San Diego, but uh, anyway, I took off from an airport in California. And I went through and I, and I looked at the map and I go like, this is nuts. Why would you fly through the Guadalupe Pass? Five miles south of here, you're still clear of the Mexico border. You can miss the mountains entirely. <laughs> but we were teenagers. <laughs> we were told by the corporate pilot for Ronson to fly straight through the pass. And what did we know? We were, you know, dickheads yeah. and we flew straight through the pass and it was uh the most difficult flying experience of my life but it led to a great mo uh moment in the book okay so so steve you're going to tell me what to do now i just well, respond first thing everything. is first thing is Thank you very much for being here. I, you know, it was so great when you uh, and Kern too agreed to be, you know, when April and, and did the send off for April and Chris back mm -hmm. in 2014 at the Candlelight Farms. And I, I was looking at those pictures again today, fondly. That was that was a great day. It was also a perfect weather day, if you recall. I mean, it was just, oh, it was, it was beautiful. as good as it gets. It was beautiful. And, and that was so great. And so I, I know a lot of people listening tonight have read Flight of Passage. And if you haven't, you're missing out. It's a, it's a fantastic book. But also, I'm just going to put a plug in. Your book, Oregon Trail, to me, was just sort of took it to another level. I mean, it's not about aviation, right? But but that's yeah. just really was a great book, and, and we really enjoyed it. And one of the people actually asked here, what was a tougher book for you to write? was was Or, or what was a tougher experience, maybe? Flight of Passage or the Oregon Trail? Okay, good question. Um, I think all of my books are really difficult. Um, uh, I built a flat boat and took it down the Mississippi a couple of years ago, and I'm writing a book about that. And uh, that's difficult to write. So, but uh, I would say that uh, Flight of Passage was more difficult to write, Steve, because you know, I had to deal with my father and his his impact on us. So, yeah, uh, maybe Flight of Passage. Also, it, it was my first book, so, you know. So it took you, so you were 14 days there and back. And now, April and Chris, what was your timeline? Um, we, we did it in 12 days. There. There. We did it in 12, 12 so, days to get there. And so he came back and they forth. Did it, they did it in 12 days to get there. Just to get there. Yeah, we, we stretched it out a bit. Yeah. I mean, today. Yeah. All right, so so read, read Flight of Passage, because you, know, you, you want to read about a couple of guys who they could get there in six days. Yeah. That's right. right. If, if I remember right, you and spent an extra I'm day. Sorry, in, I'm sorry, Chris. I don't mean to dump on you, but. No, you know. no, it's all good. You spent an extra day in. Uh, where did you spend an extra day? Chapter 17, I think, with the guy who found the treasure. Oh, oh, that was in El Paso. El Paso. Yeah. What yeah. was his name? And we, we stayed up. Uh, I forget. Uh, Good. Uh, that was an interesting. That was an interesting chapter that didn't make it into the audible book. Uh oh, I'm really embarrassed that I can't remember uh, okay. the name of the guy in El Paso. But he was a great figure in the book, and uh, what what you need in every book is a Eight. kind of a treasure of Sierra Madre kind of guy, you know. Yeah, I think his, his name was Pate. Uh, Robert Pate. Thank you. Thank you. Robert Pate. Uh, and I'm, I'm 
pretty sure he's no longer with us, but he was. <clears throat> and, but, but that was reflected a lot in your presentation tonight, which was, you know, you take the risk, you do the flight, you do the trip, and then you meet all these amazing people yeah. along the yep. And we did. And, 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 and you're going like, you're going like, well, yeah, I'm this cool guy. I'm flying a Piper Cup to California. And then you meet people along the way who are, who are even cooler than you. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> but but it, it, it might never have occurred to them. Yeah. Uh, to leave their county or whatever. So that that's... A cool thing, like like there was a. Uh, just to remember, there was a guy at Carlsbad, New Mexico, a mechanic, who was there to service all the uh, ag planes, who were, uh, you know, crop spraying the fields around Carlsbad, and he saw us come in. He took one look at that cub and he said. And, and that was where we kind of limped in because the uh, uh, the soundproofing, yeah, uh, it was the uh, the cowling fairing, uh, you know, blew off or, or was actually uh, dragging us, and it made it sound like the engine was about to fail. And we land there in uh, Carlsbad. And this guy, you know, he goes like, ah, it's nothing. We just rip these fairings off the plane, you know, as soon as we buy them, you know. And then he 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 didn't he didn't like the way the engine sounded. So he gave it a tune up, you know, right there. Uh, and I gotta tell you. I mean, there was no way we could ever have reached 11,006 feet to cross the uh, Gu Guadalupe Pass. No way. If that guy hadn't, hadn't fixed our engine. So the country was full of people who wanted to help you along the way. And I said to this guy, and and that's a lot of what you talked about tonight. But I said to this guy, you know, like, uh, what do we owe you? And he said, you take that wallet out of your pocket and I'm going to, you know, shoot you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, and, and it, it, the book, and everything I've experienced about America since then is is all about the spirit of being an American and supporting adventure. You know, definitely. I think I think Ringer. I think that sums it up just about as good as anything can. And you know, it's it's so great to see. Uh, not, not just people chasing your adventure, but but just people chasing adventure in general. And, and it should I'm, be adventure, adventure in general. Yep. Yeah. And I want to thank April and Chris so much for taking the time to do this. Uh, just another another great night on the on the hump day hanger. So thanks a lot for your time. Thanks everybody for being here. Rinker, thanks so much for coming and and. Uh, and, and making this appearance tonight. It's really great to, to hear your voice and to see you again. It, it, it's great, and I enjoyed it so much. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody, and thanks for everybody for being here. Rinker, we're looking forward to your next book. Is that imminent? Uh, don't ever ask an author how long it takes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, my Mississippi River book is only about... Uh, three or four months away from being finished, but with everything that's going on in the country right now, it might, might take another year before it's published. That's good. Great. Well, we're looking forward to that. Chris and April, 
thank you again. Thanks everybody for being here. We'll see you next week with Steve Pierce talking about all sorts of exciting things that can happen to you when you're flying. Good night, Nancy. Uh, Thank you, great guys. Evening. Thank you so much. All right. Good night. Thanks, guys.